This week on the radio, I heard a couple of guys talking about this list they found on the internet, and it was a list of things that, that quote, real men ought to know how to do. And so they were just picking each other's brains. Can you do these things? Do you know how to do these things? And they're largely skills and and show, you know, tests of strength and, and can you know how to, to break down this and tear down this and fix this, that kind of thing. And one of the things was, can you lead yourself out of the woods using only a compass and a map? You think how that's changed generation, generationally as ta- technology has kind of taken over now with, with you know, GPSs in our pockets and 99.9% of the pa- places on the earth we can go, we can get a, a signal, you know, it's, it's really kind of pushed to the side that long-lasting technology, basic primitive technology of a compass. But what, what say we? Could we use a compass to get out of a situation we were lost in? It's inter- interesting and fascinating when you consider how long we have depended upon the compass. I mean, not only centuries, but thousands of years, even predating Christ. How does a compass work? It's a thin little piece of metal that's magnetized. And when it's magnetized, that it means it has a North Pole and a South Pole. And when you put that needle in a frictionless environment, it's going to naturally be attracted to the North Pole. The South Pole of that needle will automatically be attracted to the North Pole of our Earth, the magnetic North Pole of Earth, because the Earth is largely oriented that way. And what that means is from any point on the globe, you can always know where North is. And therefore, you can always figure out where any other direction is. Once you know where north is, you know where south is and west and east. And you can always know the first step to get out of where you are and the next step to get out of where you are when you can align yourself with north based on that primitive, basic technology. Why does that work? It works because north never changes. North never changes. And once we know where that is, we can get alignment, and then we can begin to make decisions about how to then act and walk and get out of wherever we might be. The same principle is true for us as we find ourselves as Christians, knowing we are citizens of heaven, but also knowing that we are citizens of earth. We have what we've called dual citizenship. Paul talked about our heavenly citizenship in Philippians 3 and verse 20. And it's contrasted with the false teachers who their end is destruction, verse 19. One of the things they do is that they think on the things of the earth. But our citizenship, our dwelling is ultimately in heaven, and it's from heaven we await our Savior. And that's contrasted with those false teachers too because our end is not destruction, our end is salvation. But the key is, is that we find our steps We find our bearings, we find our alignment when we find true north from the values of heaven. Yes, we're citizens of earth. We're citizens of of Parrish or Walker County or, or Jasper. We're citizens of Alabama. We're citizens of the United States of America. And when we find tension between that earthly citizenship and our heavenly citizenship, it must be heaven's values that guide us in exercising our earthly rights. We look to heaven to make decisions on earth. So you see the compass connection, right? We're always finding true north. What is it that heaven's values dictate? I find the principles of God, the never-changing principles of God, and then I discover what I must value most. And the decisions I have to make as a citizen, I'm going to use those values, those built on those principles, to then make those decisions. So what we want to do this morning is first explore how Paul models this for us in Acts chapter 16. So if you want to turn to your text of, of Scripture to the New Testament, the book of Acts will be in Acts chapter 16, and then we'll turn to 1 Timothy 2 in just a moment. But first, we need to see how when God has blessed us with these rights as citizens, Paul lived in a completely different type of government system in the time of Rome, first century Roman Empire, and yet he still had rights. And what we can observe in the life of Paul is how he used his rights in different situations for the end goal of righteousness. He was driven by heaven's values, the valued righteousness that came from God, and that guided him in making decisions about his rights. We can then apply some principles to our rights as Americans today, including, not not excluding, not exclusive to, but including how we vote when we talk about the election coming up soon. 
So let's go to Acts chapter 16. And the background here is that Paul and Silas are in Macedonia. They're in Philippi. They've already converted Lydia at the riverside. Now they're going through the city. And there's this little slave girl. And slaves were common in the Roman Empire. But this slave girl had a demon. She was possessed by an unclean spirit. She was following Paul and Silas around and she was t telling everybody, she was making a commotion, saying these guys are servants of the Most High God. So Paul kind of gets tired of having to deal with that and it, it gets annoyed and he casts the demon out of the young girl. He does a service to her. He casts out this demon that was causing her difficulty. She had no choice in the matter and it inhabited her. That happened in the first century, doesn't happen any longer. Using his power as an apostle, he cast the demon out. Notice what happens, verse 19. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. What they did and what they showed is how it looks when we use our individual rights to help the vulnerable. Why was she vulnerable? Not because she was a slave, not because she was young, but she was especially vulnerable because her owners were taking advantage of her. Her owners were monetizing her unclean spirit. See how despicable that is? They were taking this thing that she could not control and they were leveraging it for their benefit. And Paul cast the demon out. He used his right and his apostle, his power to serve the vulnerable. It's a starting point for thinking about our rights. Will we use our rights to help those who are in positions beyond their choosing to be able to help them in their vulnerable state? Now, as the story continues, the owners are mad. They turn them in. The magistrates do their deal. They get mad. They throw them into prison. They have them beaten. And while they're in prison, they worship. They sing. They pray. And then one night, God allows this earthquake to happen. And miraculously, all of their chains and bonds are broken. They're free. But then notice what happens, verse 27. When the jailer woke. So he had, they had a jailer protecting the, the prison, and yet he was asleep. When he woke up. He saw that the prison doors were open. They had a path to freedom. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Tough time. It's, it's a turning point. It's a, it's a very, very tense moment now. Verse 28. But Paul, but Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Now, all of the prisoners had that open door. They could have run out. They could have made their escape. But especially remember that Paul and Silas are innocent. They do not deserve to be there. And as we're going to see later, they have not even went through the proper channels and the proper trials in order to be there. But they're there. And they have a free path, no chains, and an open door. But what have they done? They've abstained from their rights. They've chosen to stay when they could have left. They had the right to leave as a citizen, but they chose to stay. Why did they choose to stay? Because they cared about that man's life. Because they cared about that man's soul. Ultimately, it benefited the gospel. Think of how differently this story and then the church at Philippi is forever changed if they had escaped. He takes his own life his whole family hears and obeys the gospel. He obeys the gospel. They're baptized. What made the difference? They stayed. They refused to just take their right selfishly. They abstained for the sake of the gospel. But the story continues. After he's baptized, after his whole household is saved, they go back to the city to kind of clean up the mess. And the magistrates, the one who kind of made the call, they just send word, hey, tell them to, to go on their way, tell them to leave in peace. We'll not make a big deal about this. We'll just keep it all quiet. What happens in verse 37? Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who were Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? You hear the, the combination of the two words, publicly and secretly? said, we were innocent, and they threw us in here publicly. They made a big deal about it. And now they're going to tell us to leave secretly, quietly, without anybody knowing? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. You need to respond and repent, as we would call it in scriptural language. You need to make us clear from this case just as publicly as you condemned us when we were innocent. 
You see how that benefits the gospel? If they just left out of town at night and, and skirted out and, and people woke up and said, well, where were Paul and Silas, those troublemakers? Where'd they go? Well, they must have paid somebody off. They must have, have, have gotten somebody to just turn their heads the other way. They're scoundrels. See, that would have impacted how Philippi treated the church in Philippi, Lydia and the jailer and his family. But because they were cleared publicly by the government, by those leaders, that impacted for good the gospel that proved they were innocent in the eyes of the law, that proved that they had, should not, never have been there. They apologized and made them clear publicly. So you see here three different responses, but all anchored to the same ultimate true north. Paul, Paul had a clear vision of this, decided by God's principles. He had decided this is the value that I must choose to live by. So he used his rights to help the helpless, to help those who were in difficult situations beyond their control. He sometimes said, I'm not going to exercise my rights. Sometimes he said, I am going to exercise my rights. The common thread is it's always guided by what does not change, the values of heaven. Now this single narrative is civic rights. Okay, His rights as a citizen. But it's completely consistent with what he would say in several other situations in the church. You remember? There are spiritual rights within the church. And so when you get to this issue of meat offered to idols, he would say for himself that he's willing to abstain. He's willing to not eat, not exercise what's right. He would say he's willing to not get paid by a church if it meant it was benefiting the gospel in that area. But he would also say at the conclusion of all of those kind of discussions, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whatever you do, whatever it is that you choose, whether you eat or drink, you do all to the glory of God. Paul exercised his civic rights with the same principles that he exercised those spiritual rights in the church. Verse 33, he says, I don't use these rights in the church for my own advantage, but I do it for the sake of many, that many may be saved. It's the same perspective he had when it came to his civic rights. Whether I exercise them or if I abstain, I'm going to do it for the sake of the gospel. It was clearly locked in with values on unchanging principles that came from God. What does that look like? Just quickly to illustrate, we do in this country have a civic right, a protected right of free speech. Now there are some occasions when that free speech, we have the right to say it, but we may be punished for it. It has consequences, okay? Sometimes the consequence is we, we just look ignorant, we look dumb, or we sound angry, or we sound this way or that way. We have the right to say it. But you know, we also have the right to remain silent. We hear that when there's an arrest made. We have that right all the time too, don't we? And James would say it's a wise thing. It's a good thing. Let every person be swift to hear, but slow to speak, slow to wrath. It takes wisdom to know that there are a lot of times we need to exercise that right for free speech for the sake of the gospel. Tell people about God, about Jesus Christ, and about salvation. Use that to benefit the church. There are times when it might be good to just be silent, to listen. Not silent about the gospel necessarily, but maybe silent about some other things that are peripheral. And as we kind of marry and, and kind of intermix that right to free speech and the right to vote, I think it's good to just, this is me, so if you disagree here, that's, that's fine. But the, the power behind the right to vote does not come from us explaining our vote. The power and the right to vote is in the vote itself. It does not matter what, to, to the world and to, to the nation, it does not matter. Okay, we're going to get to, to seeing how it does matter. But, but our power is not found in how many other people we convince to vote like we vote. And so we go and we vote a certain way. It does not matter how much we share that vote on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram about why we voted that way. The power is in the vote itself, not in our screaming it, not in our repeating it. Let's talk more about Jesus, our Savior, than we do about the people we vote for. But let's be committed and strong in how we vote. We can find the balance, exercising our rights, abstaining from some of our rights, all with the gospel guiding the way. Now quickly, this is not kind of in our logic, but it's, it's, it's too clear in this text to pass it up. We'll talk about it again next week. Lord willing, when we're together. But why were the officials confused about their citizenship? You know, in verse 38 
of the text of Acts uh, 16, the police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard they were Roman citizens. We didn't know y'all were Roman citizens. Hold up. That changes everything. How are they confused? You go back to verse 20. The owners of the slave girl said these are Jews and they are doing things that our Roman customs do not allow. So they took the word of the accusers and they ran with it and introduced more and more variables and Paul and Silas were mistreated. Chaos theory, you know what that is? That the more variables you introduce into a system, the more potential there is for chaos. How many variables were in between these magistrates and these officials and Paul and Silas? There were several variables and it had led to misunderstandings, confusion, and ultimately a lack of truth. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know they were Roman citizens. Question, when we make decisions about who we vote for, about how we vote, what parties, what um, platforms, what amendments, how many variables are between us and the information we're hearing? Has that number gotten smaller or larger over the past decade with technology? I mean, serious question. If we're going to go around and we're going to make decisions in this era of technology, do we have discernment and intentionality to be able to know what is true and what is not? What is spin and what is fact? What is popped up in my timeline because some geek in San Francisco tells it to pop in my timeline, right? Or am I able to choose and discern what is right? We'll talk more again about it next week, but we need to understand that, that there's a vital role for the media and for press. A free press is a very important right in this nation. But the more we lean on those who tell us what things mean, the more we're setting ourselves up for danger instead of relying on them to tell us what has happened. There's a difference. That's a judgment against us if they think we need them to tell us what it means, right? They don't trust us. Let's rely on them and the role they play to tell us what happens, not what it means. And the easiest sources to find are probably the least trustworthy, just as a general rule. But let's just notice that, that chaos happens and rights are trampled on in this instance in Acts 16 because some people listened to the wrong sources and did not verify and were unintentional about that process. All right, let's shift. Let's be as practical as we can. If we're going to establish our rights and use them or maybe abstain from them, if we're going to use them from the vulnerable, but all for the sake of the gospel, where's the starting point in Scripture? How can we have a scriptural perspective of this? And I think 1 Timothy 2 that Brother Don mentioned in our prayer for our nation before worship and then that we read in our scripture reading, I think it's a wonderful place to start because it tells us to pray for our leaders with a purpose. Let's reread that text from 1 Timothy 2 together to ground us there. First of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions. That, that's going to be our key word, kind of a bridge word, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, Godly and dignified in every way, this is good. It's inherently good. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Let's start at the end of that text, verse 4. You see Paul's bearings. You see the compass pointing to true north. This is good in itself, and it pleases God, the God who saves, and his desires are for salvation. And so everything he said before that about praying for all people and praying for those in high positions for a purpose, verse 2, is because it pleases God and because we know God desires souls to be saved. When we think about our prayer life, when we think about what we might call politics, when we think about voting, when we think about all of our rights as citizens, we have the courage to take as many steps back as we need to, to honestly see what are my strongest desires and are they in alignment with God's desires that I ultimately desire most for souls to be saved by knowing truth. That's the anchoring point. That's the alignment point. Okay? Now, with that in mind, look back to verse 2. That is the purpose statement that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life, godly and dignified in every way. Four ways to break this down as we work through praying with these values, voting with these values, and exercising these values, these rights in the other capacity. Number one, what about life itself? That we may lead a peaceful and quiet 
Life, do we take that word for granted? Do we take that concept for granted? Life itself is the fundamental cornerstone for everything else we do. Sometimes we may just kind of in passing and small talk kind of language say, well, I just don't know how this has happened. I just don't know how we are so bad and so immoral as a culture and, and all this. And it's fundamentally true that one of the reasons, one of the hallmark reasons we are so upside down and backwards collectively as a culture is that we not only devalue life, we have become complacent and comfortable with destroying life. There, there are so many circles that take for granted and leverage this right to destroy life as part of their power, as part of their policy platforms. They don't just allow it, but they use terms like increase access to it. That's scary. No wonder, no wonder we're missing on a lot of things because life itself is precious and to destroy it is to destroy a creature made in the image of God. That's what God said when Noah and his family get off the boat in Genesis 9. Now, you know, what do you think God's going to say, right? I mean, the, all that just happened, mankind was terrible, the flood, the promise with the rainbow. They get off the boat, and one of the things he says is man who sheds, the blood of man will have his blood shed because man is made in the image of God. Because every life that's ever lived since Adam has borne the mark of its maker to take the power into our hands to choose life or death is a very affront to God and so when we when we vote it's not the only way we can do this but when we vote we can love our neighbor we can love the thousands of neighbors in the womb who are destroyed every day we can love our neighbor who's older, advanced in years, maybe can't remember anything, and they're on beds and they're using resources. And, and some people would say, you know, we would just clear up the system if we can get rid of these older people. If we would give them the right to choose to die later in life, that would just clear up some resources. Is that value and honor life made in the image of God? When we vote, that's one way to show our love to our neighbor in those situations. Who's going to show our love to, to neighbors that may have a genetic difference or a chromosomal deficiency? And you run all these tests, and the doctor says, well, if you don't want to keep it, you don't have to. Who's going to love those neighbors? Who's going to prove to be a neighbor to them? We can do that in a lot of ways, and we need to in a lot of different ways. But one way is to be sure how we vote is in alignment with the will of God. One party in particular loves to celebrate this right to destroy, this, this provision to destroy. So will we exercise that right to benefit the gospel and benefit life itself? Number two, you notice his, his wording is that we may lead, that we may lead peaceful and quiet life. Now what he's not saying is that we cannot lead a quiet and peaceful life until the emperor decides to do what I want him to do. But what he is referencing is that for the most part, that emperor and those powers that be, those local governors, have the ability to set the environment, to set the culture, so that we might be as responsible as we can be. And so we need to honor and understand the important role of personal responsibility. So there's a lot of discussion about issues that hinge on whether or not citizens accept responsibility or not. It's just what it comes down to. And so we understand that, that God has designed us to answer to him for each of our decisions. And we understand that, that it's freeing to be able to choose, exercise personal responsibility, self-control, self-discipline. Again, not selfishness, but to choose, to choose to exercise personal responsibility. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. That's a principle of life. And if we have a ticket or a party or a piece of legislation or a policy that its aim is to just merely bail out, is to merely remove responsibility, is that honoring God? Is that the best environment 
for the will of the gospel to verse 4. What's Paul saying? Galatians 6 verse 7, do not be deceived, don't be lied to, don't buy into the lie. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that will he also reap. When we find ourselves, we find elements in the culture that say, give me, give me, give me that have not sown first, Paul says that's mocking God. We invest, we invest, we give, we sow, we sow, and that's what yields. The harvest law, the harvest principle never changes. And we need to understand that, that it sounds rough to some people to champion personal responsibility, but very often... The most loving thing we can do for people, to love our neighbor, is to allow them that chance to grow in accepting responsibility. Allow them that chance to grow taking on upon themselves to be self-disciplined and exercise self-control. Number three, peaceful and quiet. That we may lead peaceful and quiet lives. Everyone would claim to desire peace. Romans did a pretty good job of it, despite having this kind of oligarchical king oriented uh, system of government, they had a lot of peace. They were known for peace despite their vast empire. Paul says, I don't need them to give me peace. I need them to rule in such a way that it's so honorable and respectful that it allows for us to live peaceful and quiet lives because that will open up doors for the gospel. Where's peace? How do we enjoy it in terms of this nation and any nation? What happens when we abide by the principles that we discussed last week in Romans 13? When you have citizens who are submissive and obedient, and you have leaders, government leaders, who punish the wrongdoer, who know the difference in right or wrong, and they are consistent in punishing the wrongdoer, you can enjoy peace. What happens when citizens fail to respect, fail to submit, fail to obey those government leaders? What happens when government leaders assume too much of their power and they don't know right from wrong and they don't consistently enforce punishment on the wrongdoer what happens when the government leaders themselves are wrongdoers do we have peace we need to answer this next question with a broad view in mind don't just think about the past two three four years but think decades Go, go back to after World War II and that great victory and that success and that booming time for this nation. And in the years since, that was a highlight, a, a big turning point, a lot of success. But in the decade since, how has it worked out for us to become increasingly secular and more secular and more secular away from God? How has it worked out to hear the mobs cry out for this right or that right or this or that? and then to cave into the mobs? How has that worked out? How is that working out? Do you ever quiet a violent mob, a terrorist threat, by giving in? What, what's, what's it going to take? I mean, as, we, as we vote and as we pray and as we exercise our rights, do we have a clear perspective on what God tells us leads to peace? Ultimately, it's Jesus that gives peace. We didn't have a clear mind. There are certain perspectives that, and mindsets and worldviews that will lead to a peaceful environment, and others will not. I know we feel like the psalmist in Psalm 120 sometimes. This is verse 6. Too long I've had my dwelling among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. It's hard. It's difficult. And oftentimes the solution doesn't seem clear to begin with. It's not a popular solution. What's best is always what's right from the Word of God. When we find our bearings with Him, we can find that path to a peaceful environment. And it's incumbent upon us, no matter the situation. You know, you go to Matthew 5 and you see Jesus saying, Blessed are the peacemakers, or blessed are, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Guess what? The very previous verse, verse 9, He says, Blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called sons of God. That tells me Jesus wants us to know that even in environments where we may be persecuted, it's still possible for us to make peace. So when we pray, when we vote, when we exercise our rights, we have a clear view of peace such that it leads toward the gospel. And finally, we must consider the role of morality, godliness. We may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Are we living out morality? Are we seeking a path, an environment that will honor godliness, dignity, Reverence in all that we do. 
It starts with us. We must be sure we are living those lives of morality, but it also depends on the direction of legislation, the direction of a party, the direction of a platform. And frankly, some of these things are just, they're amazing and, 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 and terribly depraved. When you talk about how marriage has been undermined, the morality behind marriage has been undermined and thrown out the window, and sexuality, and, and children are being exploited because of these kinds of things. Morality, immorality is held up as a standard, and now everyone has the right to be as immoral as they want. When Paul would write to the church in Galatia, he was talking about freedom in Christ, spiritual freedom. But I think the principle of Galatians 5 verse 13 still applies. You've been called to freedom, but only don't use your freedom as a means or an opportunity for the flesh. Yes, you're free, but don't use it to serve your flesh. Why do you make such a big deal about morality? Just let people be to themselves. A, we know that morality is the only way to peace. Like you can't have peace without morality. Immorality causes more and more problems and more and more heartache. But it's also because we know the principle of sowing and reaping and that we talked about Galatians 6 and verse 7, what's eight, verse 8 say? That those who sow to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. We hate immorality, not because we think we're better than other people, but because we know where that ends. And our desire is where? True north. It's souls to be saved, to come to the knowledge of truth. And so we sound old-fashioned, we sound rigid about marriage and about sexuality and about all these other issues, but it's because we care most about that judgment day when each one will answer for everything they did in the body, whether good or evil. And we want an environment, we want a culture, we want a nation in which we can share the gospel, and bring people to Jesus who forgives and exercise that life of peace and morality this side of judgment. And it's an opportunity, it's a blessing to have the right to pray, always, but in this nation, the right to vote. It's a, it's a means in which we have a voice and a right. May we find that true north, the gospel, in order to anchor ourselves as we prepare to make our voice known in this nation and in this state. Quickly, as we close, let me just challenge us this way. Every election season, every election year, presents a different set of questions, a unique set of circumstances. And one of the neat things about the church is how diverse the church is. I know a lot of people around the nation would look at, at this assembly this morning and say, ah, that's not very diverse, but it is. When you look at backgrounds and, and upbringings and where people have lived and different cities and different countries even, and you know, military background, non-military background, work with your hands background, I mean, there's so many different backgrounds and ways of living and ways of life. A wide range of generations. What if this week, as we're working through these final kind of issues and questions about this election season, what if we made a call to somebody who's in a different generation from us? What if we stopped by their house and we responsibly outside on the patio, you know, Corona safe, just had a, a conversation? We're, we're so isolated. We, we need each other. We need to encourage each other. What if we come together about these election anxieties and just pick each other's brains? When we realize what a resource it is that we have older generations who lived through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. When they see today what we're reaping from the seeds that were sown then, what might they do differently? They might have some very wise and important advice for us who are younger. I know it looks like we who are younger generations have a, have a lot of shortcomings and, and we have our share. But we also have some, some good things that, that we've kind of honed in on and are focused on. And so maybe even older generations can, can learn from us and younger generations. What if we decide we're going to lean on each other, we're going to learn from each other as we work through this election season and the various questions that we might have? I can't answer all those questions in a single sermon or a, a single series of sermons or, or our elders can't answer them all in a Bible class over time. I mean, it's, it's just a lot of different questions. But what if we lean on each other to help ourselves work through those wide range of questions? Most important question this morning is, are you saved? Are you a citizen of heaven? If you're not, today is the day to make that decision. Put him on a baptism where he saves, where he adds you to his church, where he promises to send Jesus Christ, the Savior, at the end of this age to come and get you to take him home with him, take you home with him. If you need to make that decision this morning, don't wait, don't delay. Come now as we sing together.